the topic of tonight's talk is occasions for breaking the five precepts. I understand that you have had several discussions about this and Dr. Wong has compiled some of your conclusions and emailed them to me. You all are very concerned about holding the precepts very tightly and I see the words good and bad and okay, not okay mentioned so often in the emails that were sent to me. In this world, in our conventional world, good and bad are very relative terms and it depends on where you're looking from. Now before we start talking about the five precepts, perhaps we should look at the overall picture of where the precepts stand in relation to Buddhist doctrines. I think many of you would probably be aware of the ten types of bad conduct and the ten types of good conduct. Do you know them? Ten Ducharitas and the ten Sujaritas. It's three, four, three. Right? Three by way of action, four by way of speech, and three by way of mind. And these ten types of bad conduct are frequently mentioned by the Buddha in the suttas. At the end of which he would say that a person who indulges in such things is liable to take rebirth in the lower realms. Let me read to you some this passages from the Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Tens, Sutta number 206. This is Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. I declare, monks, that actions, willed, performed and accumulated will not become extinct as long as their results have not been experienced, be it in this life, in the next life, or in subsequent future lives. And as long as these results of actions, willed, performed and accumulated have not been experienced, there will be no making an end to suffering, I declare. There are amongst tainted failures in living caused by unwholesome volition, issuing in suffering, resulting in suffering. These tainted failures are threefold in bodily acts, fourfold in verbal acts, and threefold in mental acts. Then he goes on to describe each of these. There is a person who destroys life. He is cruel and his hands are Bloodstained, he is bent on slaying and murdering, having no compassion for any living being. He takes what is not given to him, appropriates with thievish intent the property of others, be it in the village or in the forest. He conducts himself wrongly in matters of sex. He has intercourse with those under the protection of father, mother, brother, sister, relatives or clan, or of their religious community, or with those promised to a husband, protected by law, and even with those betrothed with a garland. In this way, tainted failure in living is threefold in bodily acts. And how is tainted failure in living fourfold in verbal acts? There is one who is a liar. Okay, I want you to listen to this one very carefully because it tells you to what extent lying entails. So he says, there is one who is a liar. When he is in the council of his community or in another assembly, or among his relatives, his guild, in the royal court, or when he has been summoned as a witness and is asked to tell what he knows then, though he does not know, he will say, I know. Though he does know, he will say, I do not know. Though he has not seen, he will say, I have seen. And though he has seen, he will say, I have not seen. In that way, he utters deliberate lies, be it for his own sake, for the sake of others, or for some material advantage. He utters divisive speech. What he hears here, he reports elsewhere to foment conflict there. And what he hears elsewhere, he reports here to foment conflict here. Thus, he creates discord among those united and he incites still more those who are in discord. He is fond of dissension, he delights and rejoices in it and he utters words that cause dissension. 
He speaks harshly, using speech that is coarse, rough, bitter and abusive, and makes others angry and cause distraction of mind. It is such speech that he utters. He indulges in frivolous chatter. He speaks what is untimely, unreasonable and unbeneficial, having no connection with the Dhamma or the discipline. His talk is not worth treasuring. It is inopportune, inadvisable, unrestrained and harmful. In this way, tainted failure in living is fourfold in verbal acts. And how is tainted failure in living threefold in mental acts? There is a person who is covetous. He covets the wealth and property of others, thinking, Oh, that what he owns might belong to me. There is also one who has ill will in his heart. What is the meaning of ill will? You better listen carefully to see the extent of ill will that is meant in this instance, because this thought of ill will can actually lead you to rebirth in the lower realms. He has depraved thoughts such as these. Let these beings be slain. Let them be killed and destroyed. May they perish and cease to exist. So it's an extremely malevolent sort of ill will, wishing for the harm and even the death of beings. And then he has wrong views and perverted ideas such as these. There is no moral value in a gift, offering or sacrifice. There is no fruit or recompense from deeds, good or evil. There is neither this world nor another world. There are no duties towards mother and father. There are no spontaneously reborn beings. There are no ascetics and Brahmins in this world, living and conducting themselves rightly, who can explain this world and the world beyond, having realized them by their own direct knowledge. In this way, tainted failure in living, which is caused by unwholesome volition issuing in suffering and resulting in suffering, is threefold in mental acts. Then I will skip the positive part and go on to the results. As to the tainted failure in living, which is threefold in bodily acts, fourfold in verbal acts, and threefold in mental acts, and which, having been caused by unwholesome volition, issues in suffering, results in suffering, it is due to that very failure in living that with the breakup of the body after death, beings are reborn in the plane of misery, in a bad destination, in the lower world, in hell. As I said, the Buddha is very categorical about these ten types of unwholesome conduct. Of course, it doesn't mean that once you kill a mosquito, you will definitely end up in hell. But the possibility is there. The Buddha is saying that if you conduct yourself in such ways, in any of these ten ways, you are creating the potential for rebirth in the lower realms. But not only that, he says, I declare monks that actions willed, performed and accumulated will not become extinct as long as their results have not been experienced, be it in this life, in the next life, or in subsequent future lives. And as long as these results of actions willed, performed and accumulated have not been experienced, there will be no end to suffering, I declare. So what he's saying is that if you kill a mosquito, or kill a rat, or you kill other pests, that itself is bad karma, unwholesome karma. That itself will create the potential for bad results to be experienced either in this very life, in the next life, or in future lives. The opposite of this, if someone restrains himself from these ten types of bad conduct, then the Buddha says the good result is that he will be reborn in a good plane of existence as a deva or as a human being. This one comes from Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Eights, Sutta number 40. The taking of life, when indulged in, developed and pursued, is something that leads to hell, to rebirth as a common animal, to the realm of the hungry shades, the slightest of all the results coming from the taking of life is that when one becomes a human being, it leads to a short lifespan. All right. So after you have taken life, you have killed the mosses, you may not be reborn in hell, but if you come back as a human being, your lifespan would be short. 
The slightest of all the results coming from stealing is that when one becomes a human being, it leads to the loss of one's wealth in various ways. You know, people will cheat you, although you may be a very honest person. And this may happen whether in this life or next life, in future life. The gravest result of all these types of bad conduct is that you will be reborn in the lower realms. Right? But the slightest one is, the slightest of all the results coming from illicit sexual behavior is that when one becomes a human being, it leads to rivalry and revenge. Right? So if you have committed sexual misconduct before in a past life, don't be surprised if you have a lot of rivals and people who want to take revenge in this life, even though you may think that you are innocent. The slightest of all the results coming from telling lies is that when one becomes a human being, it leads to being falsely accused. The slightest of all the results coming from divisive tail-bearing is that when one becomes a human being, it leads to the breaking of one's friendships. The slightest of all the results coming from abusive speech is that when one becomes a human being, it leads to unappealing sounds. All the traffic outside. <laughs> and other sounds, you know, that you don't like. The slightest of all the results coming from idle chatter is that when one becomes a human being, it leads to words that aren't worth taking to heart. Uh, you'll be very frustrated to be in a situation where people are just talking nonsense and you don't want to listen but you cannot escape from that situation because why? your karma made you land up in such a situation the drinking of fermented and distilled liquids when indulged in, developed and pursued is something that leads to hell to rebirth as a common animal to the realm of the hungry shades the realm of the hungry shades means the realm of ghosts the slightest of all the results coming from drinking fermented and distilled liquors is that when one becomes a human being, it leads to mental derangement. Mental derangement means you might become a schizo or you might become very neurotic, various sorts of mental derangement. I'm not trying to scare you all. No. Now there's another sutta where the Buddha talks about dark and bright karma. Have you heard of this one? This comes from Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Force, Sutta number 232. It talks about dark karma and bright karma. It's a permutation of four. So you have dark karma, you have bright karma, then you have dark and bright karma, and then you have neither dark nor bright karma. I think all of you know what dark karma is, right? This is 232. In Sutta number 234, a few suttas after that, dark karma is defined as someone who kills living beings, steals what is not given, engages in illicit sex, tells lies and drinks, fermented and distilled liquors that are the basis for heedlessness. So the five precepts. Right? Dark karma is breaking the five precepts. And what is white karma? White karma is the opposite, refraining from death. So, dark karma will give you dark results. Like what we talked about just now. Bright karma will give you bright results. But what is dark and bright karma? Okay, dark and bright karma is because the mind works so fast. Say for example, a serial killer is on the loose and then you go and kill that person. By killing that person, you feel that you'll be saving many people. Why not? Is that good karma or bad karma? If you're a judge, you pass a sentence. This guy is a serial killer, a serial rapist. So, you pass a sentence, I mean, you're not serial rapist, you won't die. If you're a serial murderer or someone who traffics in drugs, according to the law, you know, it's capital punishment. You sentence him to death. So, is that good or bad? I saw that some of your responses, if it's not for your own personal good, it's for the good of society, then it's good. But you cannot bargain with karma. <laughs> you cannot bargain, you know. The thing is that this is dark and bright karma. Maybe you're doing a good thing. And as a doctor, you have to kill parasites, yeah? Kill all the worms. 
and maybe you have to give the order if you're a medical officer you know, to kill all the mosses because then there's a dengue epidemic going around. That is dark and bright karma. Do tambor together. <laughs> right? So you have to face it now. Being in this world is not easy. It's suffering. It's like a double-edged sword. Catch-22. You know, do this also? Cannot. <laughs> like that also cannot. You do both also cannot. You have to do something. Right? And that's why often after a person has listened to the Buddha's talk, then he will realize, in Pali he will say, Sambado Garawaso Rajo Pato Abo Kaso Babaja. What does that mean? He says, the household life is constrained and constricted. It's like a dirty, dusty path. Renunciation, living the homeless life, it's like the open air is spacious. It seems like very paradoxical. You think that we monks have got only 227 precepts. But these are only the major ones, you know. There are thousands and thousands of other little precepts that we don't recite every fortnight. Every fortnight we recite only the 227. But there are many thousands of other minor rules. And yet, it's easier to keep these thousands of minor rules than it is to keep the five precepts as a lay person. We will be constantly faced with all these dilemmas because you are in the lay world, you want to survive. And in the end of it, ask yourself, you say, no choice, ma. my position is like that, I have to lie. If I don't lie, then my boss will get angry and then I might be sacked. Are you sure you got no choice? Your choice is either to be sacked <laughs> or to maintain your position. That is your choice. <laughs> the choice is always there. So what is it that prevents you from taking the other choice? Huh? What do you think? Craving, ma. Isn't it? You want to maintain your job, you want to maintain your status, you maintain all this. It's craving that's bringing you there. It's craving that is preventing you from being impeccable in the five percent. What else? And what is behind the craving? Ignorance, la. Yeah. You are ignorant, you don't see that it is not worth craving for all this. It is not a good bargain to break your precepts in order to get what you want. You don't see that. Ignorance is bliss. Because of ignorance, you crave. And because of craving, you give all sorts of justifications. But as I said, you cannot bargain with karma. That's the way it is. The law of gravity is the law of gravity. You cannot throw an apple up in the air and say, today I'm making a special wish, so please grant me my wish and don't let it fall. Sometimes it happens, it seems like the Bodhisattva, on the day before he became a Buddha, this is what the commentaries tell us. <laughs> he had this stone bowl which he threw into the river and he made this determination. He said, if I'm destined to be enlightened, let this stone bowl, instead of sinking to the bed of the river, flow upstream. Uh, and it flowed upstream. But that one could be due to divine intervention. Maybe some devas already predicted that he will become a Buddha. So that's why they did something to it. <laughs> so I think having an overview of the five precepts in relation to karma and how categorical the Buddha was in defining these 10 types of bad conduct is very important. It's very categorical. You know, the sort of ill will that you have in your mind that can lead you to rebirth in the lower realms is something very, very malicious, very, very malevolent. Wishing that somebody will die, will perish, will disappear. Not just getting angry at the person, but wishing for him to die. Maybe I told this to you all before. <laughs> In 1984, when I was with Saru Pandita in IMS in Barry, Massachusetts, we had one yogi. She's probably a very dosa charita, very angry sort of temperament. You can see the way she behaves. Even when she does walking meditation, it seems that she's doing stomping meditation, <laughs> stomping around. And the anger is like everybody can feel the anger around her. And one day she was seated in the meditation hall and then. She happened to sit behind her enemy, another woman. And as he sat down, because the woman was in front of her, 
close her eyes and then maybe because of her energy <laughs> anyway the moment she sat down she began to visualize her enemy and she was chopping her to pieces killing her in the meditation <laughs> she was supposed to do vipassana meditation but there she's creating her own video her own production killing her enemy that sort of ill will is really very potent even though you don't do anything about it you just think about it that can create the potential for you to be reborn in the lower realms even if you're not reborn in the lower realms you can also receive the results of it in this very life somehow okay now let's have a look at where the five precepts stand in relation to these ten types of good conduct one of the things that you will notice is that refraining from intoxicants is not included in the ten types of good conduct right not so you all can go and have a boost tonight <laughs> <laughs> This is interesting. I was listening to Bhante Bhikkhu Bodhi's lecture the other day. He was talking about the Noble Eightfold Path and somebody pointed out, Hey, how come in the Noble Eightfold Path, as you can see, in right action, abstaining from alcohol, intoxicants is not included? Why not? Yeah, it's not included. And they asked the question, why it's not included? Now, different people have got different interpretations. Some people say, now, before coming to Abante Bhikkhu Bodhi's interpretation, some people say that it's a prerequisite. That's why it's not inside there. Now, before you can start to walk the Noble Eightfold Path, you must have abstained from liquor, or else you won't be able to walk the path. But Bhante Bhikkhu Bodhi says that if you look at the right speech and right action in the Noble Eightfold Path, as well as in the ten types of good conduct uh, related to the body and to speech you will see that those things that are negative if they are indulged in if they are executed they will actually cause harm to other people right not? they can cause harm to other people whereas if you take intoxicants taking intoxicant by itself does not really harm people yet until they get drunk until you become intoxicated and then you cannot control your senses and then you start to break all the precepts. So because it has this potency of being the cause of heedlessness, that's why it is included in the five precepts. But it doesn't mean that if you are not able to observe the five precepts, you cannot be a Buddhist. Right? The criteria for being a Buddhist is very simple. He's just taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Now, whether or not you observe the five precepts is a different matter. If you observe the five precepts, that means you are a good Buddhist, a virtuous Buddhist. If you don't, you are not a virtuous Buddhist, but you are still a Buddhist. <laughs> I'm sure there are many Buddhists who don't hold their five precepts impeccably. So you will see that on the five precepts, actually a concession when you look at the ten types of good conduct under speech you have got three more but if you observe the five precepts you only observe one out of the four right and then it doesn't include the other three connected with the mind right so if you really want to walk the noble eightfold path you have to do more than just observe the five precepts if you look at the last three of the good conduct related to mind it also correlates with right intention of the Noble Eightfold Path. Renunciation, no ill will, and right view. You could say that renunciation is a more superior or refined form of non-covetousness. Now, you remember how I define covetousness? Covetousness means wanting something or somebody that belongs to somebody else. One thing that somebody only, somebody's girlfriend, somebody's wife only, you know. The one another woman that looks at her. You want somebody's car, that particular car, and you don't want to go and buy another car of the same model. You want that particular thing only. And having that sort of thought in your mind and indulging in it, scheming to get it, without doing anything about it, not necessarily saying anything about it or acting out anything, but just thinking about it is potent enough to create the potential 
for you to be reborn in the lower realms. So potent, right? So non-covetousness means you don't covet, but you can still desire. La. <laughs> you don't desire a car like his. Maybe I have to work harder to get more money to get a car like his, but not to get his car. It's still okay, you know, you're not doing any bad conduct. But if you're walking the noble path, even that also is not allowed. <laughs> that means that renunciation means renouncing all sense pleasures, all sense desires. That is a very okay, high form of non covetousness Somebody also brought up the precept about sexual misconduct, saying that nowadays in UK, on page 3, you have a girl in the nude, or almost in the nude. I've never seen them, so I don't know what it is. Is it in the nude or almost in the nude? <laughs> Is it in the nude or almost in the nude? Almost, okay. <laughs> almost in the nude. <laughs> and also in movies, it is something that is being capitalized on. Movie makers always make sure that this element is found in the movies to attract the crowd, to get the money. So the question is, how is this related to the five precepts? It's not related to the five precepts. In the sense that even if you look at it also, it doesn't break the precept, but it will cause lust to arise in you. If that lust is indulged in and it becomes obsessive, it may lead to breaking that precept. Now, there's another sutta in the Yangudra Nikaya which talks about how sense restraint is very important. Yangudra Nikaya book of 6, sutta number 50. If there is no sense control for monks, then the basis for virtue is destroyed for one who lacks sense control. If there's no virtue, then the basis for right concentration is destroyed for one who lacks virtue. If there's no right concentration, then the basis for knowledge and vision of things as they really are is destroyed for one who lacks right concentration. If there's no knowledge and vision of things as they really are, then the basis for revulsion and dispassion is destroyed for one who lacks such knowledge and vision. If there is no revulsion and dispassion, then the basis for the knowledge and vision of liberation is destroyed for one who lacks revulsion and dispassion. This is like a tree without branches and foliage. The buds will not mature, nor will the bark, the greenwood and the hardwood mature. Similarly, if sense control is absent, there will be no basis for virtue, etc. So, if you want to really observe your precepts well, you have to control your senses. That's why monks try not to read newspapers or to look at all those glossy magazines that will arouse lust in you. Then they're asking for trouble, right? And it will be very hard to keep your precepts. So that's why sense restraint is very important. But there's another area. By indulging in looking at Playboy or any pornographic material, you may not be breaking the precept, like I said, but it arouses lust in you, which could so eventually be very, really very conscientious about your precepts. You can actually get the respect of people. This is what the Buddha said also in Diga Nikaya Mahavari Nibbana Sutta. He was telling a group of people, there are so many benefits of observing the precepts. You observe it well enough, you will be respected wherever you go. And because you have not broken any precepts, you will be very confident in whatever assembly that you are in. Right? Whether it's with the nobles or with Brahmins or with the ministers, you can be very confident. Nothing to hide. But if you have done some cheating before, you have manipulated some figures, and then you are called to answer some queries, then you can see that you are a bit jittery because you've got something to hide. In the Dhammapada, the Buddha also talked about the fragrance of flowers, right? The fragrance of flowers can be smelled if you are standing in the direction that the wind is blowing and only from a certain distance. But the fragrance of virtue can be smelled everywhere because you will become very well respected by people. People understand, they can't keep it and you can keep it so well, they will respect you. What is it that keeps you from keeping these precepts? As I said, the choice is there, up to you, up to you. I know quite a few staunch Buddhists who have resigned from their positions 
accountants or people who are up in the managerial position, they have been forced by their superiors to do some dishonest dealings or manipulations with the accounts. So finally, they resign. And they're not suffering. I think it has been a blessing in disguise and it's brought them closer to the Dhamma, given them more time to practice. And they're still not out of job. There's one particular accountant who resigned many years ago. And still now, he gets called back to his old company on a project basis. But of course, they know that he won't do all this nonsense, so they don't <laughs> ask him to do the nonsense. <laughs> and he's very happy with that arrangement because he's not tied down. And he goes for long retreats. After he finishes his project, he will go for two, three months retreat, and then come back again to another project, go for another six months retreat somewhere else. So it could be a blessing in disguise. Now, regarding intoxicants, now you can see in this comparative chart, Taking of intoxicants is not included in the 10 types of bad conduct, nor is it included in the no willful path. But just like sense restraint, it is better to nip it at the butt. Prevention is better than cure. Somebody asked me yesterday, we also had a discussion yesterday in Bodhi Heart Sanctuary in Penang about social drinking. Also, this question was asked in the email. If you have to do social drinking, compelled by work requirements, if you entertain your guests and then you have to do a bit of drinking. Of course, the best thing is to be quite firm about your principle. Sometimes it works, but you can do it without offending people and without showing that you are trying to be better than other people. You can do it very humbly. I can tell you two very interesting stories. One is of a young man, staunch Buddhist, who went to Bangkok to clinch a business deal. He was probably only in his 40s. Went to Bangkok, met up with his clients, and they were agreeable to sign the agreement. But they said, okay, before you sign the agreement, let's celebrate, right? Why an agreement for tonight? And then he's taken aback for a while, and he says, oh, well, uh, no, I won't have wine agreement. That's against my principles. Then uh, his client says, okay, no wine, no women, no contract. <laughs> So they left him. He went back to his hotel room and this guy was probably quite disappointed. He came all the way to Bangkok and didn't get anything. So anyway, he packed and went to the airport the next day. And in the airport, his clients were there to meet him with the contract. And they said, okay, let's sign. And they said, how come? You see, you don't want to sign? Then they said, it's with people like you that we want to make business because we know you won't cheat us. <laughs> Right or not? If the person can be so conscientious in keeping his precepts, something so enjoyable, huh? wine and women, he wouldn't break the other precepts, right? He wouldn't want to cheat his clients. I think maybe it's this same person who refused wine and women. From the very beginning, whenever he would go out with his boss, his superiors, on some entertainment outings at night, he would always ask for just lemon juice or orange juice. And after some time, the boss need not have to pester him anymore. The boss will order orange juice for him. <laughs> I think this was brought up in the email regarding the Dalai Lama when he was in Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was being consulted by a scientist. And so His Holiness explained to a scientist who was quite troubled about his having to kill in the course of his work, that if he had to kill a few rats, to come up with some vaccine to save many more lives, then would it be a case of good karma or bad karma? So after what I've talked to you just now, is this good karma or bad karma? Huh? Good and bad, right? You cannot say it's good, totally good. You cannot say it's totally bad. It's good and bad or bad and good, however you want to put it. So by understanding the law of karma, we must also assume responsibility for what we want to do cannot always rely on Bante Sayadaw to give us a decision. No, you don't know the consequences, you make your own decisions. What is the payoff? Are you willing to trade off your precepts for the security that you're getting in your job? You look at it, long term and short term. Your job lasts only for how many years in this life? How long is your karma going to last you? Remember, just now I just read to you, the Buddha says, 
I declare monks that actions willed, performed and accumulated will not become extinct as long as their results have not been experienced, be it in this life, in the next life or in the subsequent future life. And as long as these results of actions willed, performed and accumulated have not been experienced, there will be no making an end to suffering, I declare. So, if you want to be awakened, want to become an Arahant, you have to pay all your coming debts. Even Angulimala. Angulimala, as you know, was a serial killer. But somehow, even though he killed so many people in this life, he was able to become an Arahant. And yet, after he became an Arahant, he was still not absolved from his deeds. What happened was, after he became an Arahant, he would go begging for food from house to house. And then, things would land on him. Broken pots, or rubbish, or broken bricks, or something like that would land on him. If landed on him doesn't mean that people purposely throw at him. He's just walking along behind the hedge, and then somebody just throw rubbish and happened to land on him. <laughs> somebody throws some broken pots, trying to chase the stray dog away, and then he came into the way and he got in head. So one day his head was broken, stood in front of the Buddha, his robe was tattered, blood dripping from his skull. The Buddha looked at him and said, Brahmin, you are lucky to get away with just this. Or else with the bad karma that you have done, you will be baking and being cooked in hell for aeons. So he's still not free. But for an ordinary person who is not an Arahant, after killing so many people, you don't know how long it's going to bake in hell. That's why in another sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya called the Salt Crystal Sutta, the Buddha gave the simile, it's a very famous simile, I'm sure you all have heard of it. Dissolving salt in a glass of water and dissolving salt in the river. What's the difference? The quantity of salt is the same, you know, in the glass and in the river. But then the saline taste will be different, right? A cup of water would taste salty, but it would be insignificant in the river water, nothing at all. So what does that mean? It means that we cannot escape from the good or the bad karma that we have performed. The potential is there, and the time is right, it will give the result. But once you come into contact with the Buddha Dharma, and you know about what is wholesome and what is unwholesome, then you must try your best to do as much wholesome deeds as you can. To increase your water, not just to a cup full of water, but to as much as the body of water in the stream. Then your bad karma will become very insignificant. Now, now coming back to that dark and bright karma, I talked about the four permutations. One is dark karma, one is bright karma, one is both dark and bright karma. And the last one is neither dark nor bright karma. What is that? What is karma that is neither dark nor bright? And give me an example. Uh, eating meat. <laughs> Again? Eating meat. Eating meat. We buy the, we buy the meat from the market. So it's neither dark nor bright. But how about the desire to want to eat? Is it dark or bright? No, no you don't have the desire. It's that survival. It's not that I like. I need that protein, so. Okay, that's one answer. That's good. Share your views. Anyone else got any idea? Kill something without knowing it. Again? Kill something without knowing it. Kill something without knowing it. Okay. According to our Buddhist definition, karma is defined as intention. So, if you unintentionally step on anything, it's not karma. Right? So, it's not action. But here he's talking about action. But it is neither dark nor bright. And it leads to the cessation of suffering. By including the last clause, it becomes very clear, isn't it? What else will lead to the cessation of suffering? But the noble, faithful path. In another sutta, 
the seven factors of enlightenment are mentioned. So the seven factors of enlightenment also lead to cessation of suffering. So if you are walking a noble eightfold path, which means not just observing the five precepts, because observing four of the five precepts is only part of the noble eightfold path. You know, noble eightfold path have to be taken with all the path factors together. You must have right view, right motivation, right intention, and right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right samadhi. So if you're walking the noble evil path, with all these factors there, you are creating karma that is neither dark nor bright, that does not perpetuate the round of samsara, but that leads you out of samsara. If you look at another sutta, the Buddha talked about the destruction of life, monks, I declare to be threefold as caused by greed, caused by hatred, caused by delusion. So too, taking what is not given, sexual misconduct, false speech, divisive speech, harsh speech, frivolous chatter, covetousness, ill will and wrong view. I declare to be threefold as caused by greed, caused by hatred and caused by delusion. Hence, monks, greed is a producer of karmic concatenation. Hatred is a producer of karmic concatenation. Delusion is a producer of karmic concatenation. And by the destruction of greed, hatred and delusion, there is the exhaustion of karmic concatenation. That is in Amutra Nikaya, Book of Tens, 174. I can't locate the sutta here, but it says that whatever intentions that are motivated by loba, dosa and moha, by desire, by hatred or by delusion, are all karma. Now, just now we talked about this type of karma, the ten types of bad conduct, the five precepts. If you misbehave by doing those ten types of bad conduct, if you break the five precepts, this has the potential of leading you to rebirth in the lower realms. But the other things, you know, you may not kill a being, but you injure the being. Why not? For example, you know that you're not supposed to swipe the mosquito, right? But the mosquito is a nuisance. Even though you brush it away, it comes around again, buzzing all over the place. So what you do is you just hit it, break its wings. <laughs> you're not killing it. <laughs> but then you just immobilize it so that it doesn't come and bother you anymore. So which is worse? Killing the mosquito or injuring its wings so that it cannot survive. I mean, it cannot look for food for the rest of its life. Huh? More suffering, right? <laughs> I used to do that. <laughs> open up, open up. <laughs> well, that's bad. Huh? Actually, it's very bad, right? Next time, the karma will come back to you in the same way. You know? Next time, you will not be killed, but you will be immobilized, paralyzed. Some of you who are subscribing to our email might know of someone in BM, the secretary of the Bugit Matajam Meditation Society. He met with an accident, affected his skull, and now he's in bed, almost unconscious. I just went to see him yesterday cannot recognize people and after 50 days there, his limbs, what do you call that? His limbs cannot, uh, contraction of his muscles, uh, it's, very, it's a very pitiful sign. So uh, you don't know, he may be a very good person, he was a good meditator, the secretary of the Buddhist society, at one time he was the president I think also. But now, in that sort of state, can he meditate or not, I wonder. I don't think so, you know, because when he opens his eyes, also he looks at you blankly. He doesn't seem to be able to recognize people. So we don't know what sort of karma we did in the past. So it's really very, very frightening. So that's why better create a reservoir of water <laughs> as much as you can. Someone also brought up the issue of telling white lies. I didn't print out the email. Something happened during the Nazi occupation or invasion in Europe and then they were looking for Jews and then this family was hiding some Jews up in the attic and so these soldiers came and asked if you have seen them. If you tell the truth, 
they're going to die. And if you lie, you're going to save them, but you break your precept. What will you do? Don't lie, lah. <laughs> so what is the coming consequences of that? What do you think is the coming consequences of that? <laughs> Next time when you are in the same position, somebody will also tell a white lie. <laughs> But it doesn't apply to all cases, you know, like in the case of a patient who is suffering from some terminal disease and as a doctor, you have come to the conclusion through your diagnosis that it is something that is going to be terminal, right? And some people, not the patient themselves, but their next of kin, prefer not to let the patient know. So as a doctor, what is the best thing to do? To tell or not to tell? I think there's also no hard and fast rule about that. You have to depend on the situation to look at the capacity of the patient to be able to handle this news, as well as the capacity of the next of kin to be able to take the necessary steps for his welfare. Right or not? Sometimes the patient might appreciate it if you tell him that. Then he will make all preparations before he goes away. Although initially there might be a lot of rejection, denial, depression and these sort of things, but eventually people will get used to it. Sometimes they do, sometimes they may not. But whatever it is, according to what we read just now, we don't tell a lie for yourself or for others' sake. Right? That's what the Buddha said. It's very categorical about that. So, understanding the law of karma is really up to all of us to exercise our discretion and to assume full responsibility for our actions. So I hope that by reading the suttas and attending Dhamma discussions, it will create better conditions for you to come to a more informed decision when you have to make difficult decisions. Okay, maybe I shall end the talk here and open to the audience for any comments or questions. Okay, any comments or questions? Yes. You said that a mosquito keeps irritating you and you get the mosquito, okay? Isn't it that mosquito's bad karma? Or is it entirely your bad karma? It's not entirely your bad karma. So if you are up to you, you can do it. That's a good question. A very good question. It's about the mossy that I hate. The question is, isn't it the bad karma of the mossy that it got hit by me? <laughs> it's true. It's the bad karma of the mossy as well as my bad karma in eating it. So actually, we are all living in a very intricate web of interconnectedness. We are actually the product of our past karma. At the same time, we are also the creators of our future destiny. It's very, very complex interaction of the past and the present. Whatever we do is a product of the past as well as present circumstances. So it's very frightening. Yes, anyone else? Yes. Um, just now you mentioned that the sense of strength is the basis for virtue. And then we are so interrelated to each other in society. Yeah? And I think the more we meditate, the more we are aware, the more we feel that there's a lot of challenges because of this uh, bad karma moving around. So how do we keep ourselves so that we can always uh, we focus on ourselves and sense of strength? I don't quite understand your question. <laughs> How to go about it, is it? Our sense is strange, but then there's a lot of challenges coming in. The more we know of it, the more it's more frightening. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of things are beyond our control, so sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And so as householders, how do we build ourselves up you know, so that we can slowly let go? Okay, complicated question. <laughs> complicated question on a complicated subject. Yeah. Yeah, since sense restraint is very important, is a basis for virtue, for keeping the precepts. 
And yet, as we meditate and we come to know more and more of the interconnectedness between us and what is around us, we face so many challenges to our senses. So, as a householder, how do we face up to these challenges? How do we cope with these challenges? Well, the first thing is that you need to have faith in karma. You understand the law of karma. You know how it's frightening. And when you know that it's frightening, that is hiri otapa. You know what is hiri otapa? That is usually is translated as shame and fear. But maybe the word shame is not so appropriate. You could say conscientious, being conscientious and having fear of the outcome of bad karma. According to the suttas, hiri and otapa, this conscience and fear of wrongdoing is equivalent to the guardians of the world. It is because of this hiri otapa that restrains people from doing bad things. It's an asset to have this fear. But don't let it overwhelm you. As you said, you begin to realize that sometimes there are lots of things beyond your control. Right? Then you begin to see anatta. Right or not? And then you begin to let go. Because it's not under your control. So why do you try to control it? If you try to control it and it doesn't listen to you, then what are you going to feel? Disappointed. Right? So, one of the benefits of doing mindfulness meditation, watching your mind to see how it reacts or responds to the six senses, is that you begin to realize anatta so clearly that your thoughts, your emotions are the product of past conditioning and present circumstances. Sometimes they are under your control, most of the times they are not. And then you begin to let go. Because for most of us, particularly those who do not practice watching the mind, we think that we are in control. The whole of society has this idea that we are in control and has this idea that things are permanent, opposite of what the Buddha says, instead of impermanent, suffering and not self. The whole world thinks that things are relatively permanent and will lead to happiness and also there is a self involved, things are under your control. Based on this delusion, a lot of suffering comes about when you find that it is not really true. I don't know whether it answers the question. So, what should we households do? Let go when you cannot control it? No, sometimes, as householders, you cannot let go completely. You have to also balance it with loving kindness and compassion. Right? For example, if you have children, you have brought them to this world, it is your obligation to bring them up, to give them proper education and care. Even though maybe at a certain stage of your life, you might think that, oh, better for me to renounce. But you cannot. Although you might want to renounce, you still have these things to take care of and these have to take priority. So it has to be balanced inside with regard to the true nature of reality, not within your control and not worth clinging or pursuing on the one hand. And on the other hand, you have got certain worldly responsibilities that you need to take care of. So you have to balance the two. Not easy. The question is, as lay people, if you observe the five precepts, the focus is more on the action rather than on the mind. Whereas for monks, it is more on the mind but also on the action. Right? The first verse in the Dhammapada says that mind is the forerunner of all things. Mind is the leader, mind is the chief. If you want to restrain your speech and your action, you must first of all learn to watch your mind, to know what's going on in your mind. You must know what intentions and what motivations you have before you speak and do, so that your speech and actions will be wholesome. There's one particular sutta called the Ambalatika Rahulovara Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, where the Buddha advised his son, Rahula. He held up a mirror and asked him, what is a mirror for? What is the mirror for? Reflecting an image, right? He said, in the same way, Rahula, before you do anything, 
think first and see whether what you're going to do is going to be harmful to yourself or to others, beneficial to yourself or to others. If you find that it's harmful to yourself and or to others, don't do it. And then while you're doing it, because you know sometimes decisions could be wrong. At first you thought that, oh, it's not going to be harmful to me or to others. But while you're doing it, you find out that, hey, no, it's actually harmful to me and to others. Then you said, stop doing it. Or you might have finished doing it and before and while you're doing it, you may have this idea that, well, it's harmless and it's beneficial. But after you've done it, then on retrospect, you find that it was harmful and it was not beneficial to me and to others. Then he said, you should go and confess. For us monks, when we do something wrong, we go and confess to our fellow monks to tell them we have done something wrong. And then he will say, do you see? And then we will say, yes, we see. Then next time, be more restrained. And then we say, yes, we will try to be more restrained in the future. That's how we help one another to walk the path. It's the same for speech. Before you say anything, think first. Is it beneficial? Is it harmful? And while you are saying, and after you have said. So the same principle applies. For thoughts also, before you think something, there is an intention that arises, isn't it? Something will pop up in your mind. And then you have to make a decision whether you want to pursue that thought or not. But if you don't watch your mind, then you become a slave of your habits. Now, whatever comes in your mind, you just think. Whatever comes in your mind without proper consideration, you just say. So that's why it's so important to mind your mind. If you mind your mind, then you can speak your mind. But if you don't, you are laying a mind for yourself. Yeah. Laying a time bomb, a mind, you know, you can step on it and you can get into trouble. So, watching the mind is important whether you are observing the five precepts or 227 precepts or thousands of precepts. Everything comes from the mind. If you can watch the mind, then don't worry about all the precepts. In fact, there was one particular sutta, huh? when a monk came to complain to the Buddha. He says, Bhante, oh, there's more than 150 rules in the Patimokha, in the monastic code. How to remember, how to train? All these rules, so much, all these trainings. Then the Buddha says, well, don't worry about that. How about just the three trainings? Sila, Samadhi and Panya. Only three, uh. only 150. <laughs> and then that should be okay. And then he agreed, but he didn't know what he was asking for. He didn't know what he was going into because sila samadhi in Panya is more difficult than just sila. <laughs> the 150 rules, only sila. But now he has got to do samadhi as well as Panya. <laughs> <laughs> so he was just fooled by the figures. But anyway, it had a happy ending. In the end, he became an arahan. <laughs> so I hope you'll become an arahan one day. Also. <laughs> Don't worry about the five precepts. Just watch one thing. <laughs> watch your mind. How is the error of, I mean, for lay people, is that everything is going on the path, right? So, if we were to try to practice or observe our mind before we do an action, it would practically slow down the thinking. So, that will actually clash with the needs of the lay people. Oh, I see. Now, how, do, how do a lay people in that time try to balance? You're saying that in this modern age where the pace of life is very fast, you have to make decisions very fast and you can't afford to reflect on your intentions too much because if you do that, it will slow down your pace, is it? Actually, the mind works very fast, faster <laughs> than the fastest computer. <laughs> it's just that the reason why we cannot make good decisions is because our minds are not pure enough. They are encumbered by many hindrances, many concerns. If your mind is really very one-pointed, you can actually penetrate into decisions very quickly. That's why we have in Pali, we call it Sati Samajanya, mindfulness and full awareness. When you practice mindfulness and full awareness, you are able to make decisions well because mindfulness means looking back at your thoughts. And then Samajanya, Full awareness, there are four aspects of it. One is you begin to see your intentions, uh, motivations, whether they are profitable or not, whether they are beneficial, one. 
Then, second is whether it's appropriate or not. The third is whether it is relevant to whatever you are supposed to do, your job spec, your scope. And finally, whether it is realistic or not. So these are the four criteria that you should assess a motivation before you carry it out. We call it the bar test. B-A-R-R, -R, okay, the bar test. If you put things to the bar test, even if it's on a conventional level, it can be very useful. In fact, I gave a talk about this formula for worldly and spiritual success based on this in Clang. And then at the end of the talk, one of the members said, what Bhante said is really true. If you can put into practice all these principles, you will become a very, very successful businessman. Because they also work on the same principle. Why not? You have to make decisions, you have to see whether it is going to be profitable or not, whether it's appropriate or not, whether it's within the scope of your organization or not, whether it's going to be realistic or not. Yeah? In fact, sometimes you have to they commission people to do a feasibility study before you embark on a multi-million dollar project. Because they have to put all these things into action. But explaining it takes a long time. So many words. But if you practice mindfulness and full awareness daily in your life, it will come very quickly. When a thought arises, it will automatically go through this bar test so quickly, faster than the wink of an eye. Okay, anyone else? Yes. question is, before we say or do anything, we should ask ourselves whether it's right or wrong, whether it's beneficial or not. So we are asking our brain, aren't we? And then our brain is also due to past conditioning. So how do we know it's really right or it's really wrong? It could be a lot of rubbish. Okay. That's also very reasonable. That's why the Buddha says it's very important to, first of all, listen to the Dhamma. First, you need to have faith in the Buddha's enlightenment. You have faith that the Buddha is fully awakened, he is really pure, and his uh, Dharma discourses are really true. And he's giving these discourses out of compassion for us and not to get anything out of us. Okay? So when he says, this is good, this is bad, this is wholesome, this is unwholesome, that comes from his own personal experience and from his very good motivation of compassion. So we believe in what is good and what is bad. Then these are from the moral point of view. To put it in a nutshell, whatever thoughts, speech or action motivated by non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion, that's good. Whatever thought, speech or action motivated by greed, hatred and delusion, that's bad. Basically, that's what it is. So you have to see la, the basis of your thinking. That's why the Buddha told his son, Rahula, is it harmful to me, to others, is it beneficial to me or to others? You need to ask yourself that. And as I said also, that could be relative. It depends on your circumstances, the way you understand it. But when you make a decision at that time, while you were thinking prior to carrying out an action, you thought that it was good. But while you're doing it, you might find that, hey, it's not really good, better stop doing. Then you stop doing. Or after you finish doing it, then you look back at your action and you thought, hey, it's not good at all. It's very harmful and very unbeneficial. Yeah, we do make mistakes, but we should acknowledge and recognize our mistakes and then be more careful in the future. So that's how we learn as we go along. Yes? We learn through mistakes like that and next life we will do the same thing again. How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> In the past life, uh. oh, you can see the past life. <laughs> yeah, that's because you grow wiser as you grow older. Yeah? <laughs> so that's why life after life is an evolution. 
after you have done all this cultivation, in your next life you become hopefully a better person if you have done it in the right way. So you may not attain the final liberation or final goal in this life, but you are progressing. Hopefully. <laughs> you have progressed since you were young, haven't you? Yeah, then you can extend that to future lives as well. How do you know you did the good thing when you can't remember? <laughs> Any assumptions? Yes. Let's say you said that when you have done something, then you realize it was the wrong thing you have done, and you have gone to sort of confess or tell yourself that you will not do it again. Does that delete your bad karma? <laughs> If you have done something wrong and then you regret about it and you tell yourself that you're not going to do it again in the future, does that delete the karma? It doesn't delete the karma. Karma has already been done. Yes, it has already been done. But because you acknowledge that it was something unwholesome that you should not have done and then you resolve that next time you're not going to do it, then that's how you can change. If you don't see that it's bad or wrong in the first place, how are you going to change? Next time you're going to repeat the action. Right? So it doesn't make any difference to the karma that you It doesn't make any difference. Except the one that I saw in the commentary. This one comes to the commentary. It says that if you had offended another person and then later on you found out and then you went to apologize, it seems that that will delete that karma if that person forgives you. Anybody else? So if we look at it, question you see that life is like a balance sheet you've got the dark karma and the bright karma and how do you know who keeps the accounts <laughs> <laughs> so that you can check you know, how much white karma how much bright karma how much dark karma <laughs> bright karma and dark karma you have done the Tibetans say that when you die and you go to the bado stage then there's someone there with the scales <laughs> measuring your dark and the bright karma <laughs> But there's only a symbolism in the Tibetan tradition. No one knows. Because samsara is so long. Samsara has an inconceivable beginning. So that's why, don't worry about how much good or how much bad that you have done. Do as much good as you can right now. Because you never know. Right? Just keep on doing. Don't think too much. that many years ago so I've really forgotten what it's all about. If you find that it's useful for you following his advice and it helps to improve positive qualities in you like patience, understanding, benevolence, goodwill, compassion and conscientiousness in your moral precepts, in your moral integrity and then gives you greater clarity of mind and you are more peaceful and calm and steady. Good lah, follow lah. Okay, last one. Yes. Another one. Two extremes, are they? 
one extreme every year we donate hundreds of tablets of rewarding and certified products. And I'm wondering whether we should continue to give hundreds of tablets of <laughs> <laughs> As I said, euthanasia also is dumb and bright karma. So you have to make your own decision and take your own responsibility. The same question was asked to me yesterday. One of the members of the audience said she had a pet and he went to the vet and the vet says that she put the pet to sleep. So what should she do? And I said, it's up to you. I was going through this euthanasia discussion in one of the emails and they said that actually it's not that difficult. Ask the pet. Because they are intelligent, they know. If you ask them, do you want to live? And if they want to live, they will try to live. If they don't want to live, they will just go off. I mean, that's the experience of the person who wrote the email. She asked her pet, and the pet actually struggled to get back to good health. But as I said, the final decision is yours. If you feel that you are helping that pet because you feel that it is suffering, you are trying to relieve a suffering, that's only your thinking. Lah. Because we don't really know what sort of karma that pet had done before in the past. And that pet is only, as the Buddha says, paying the karmic debts. And then if you interfere by ending the pet's life prematurely, you're also creating karma for yourself. And the karma that this pet is trying to repay has not fully been repaid. So he has to be repaid in another existence maybe. But you have already created another new karma. So, if you brought the pet back and you just continue to feed it as best as you can and it dies a natural death, you're not creating any bad karma. Right? You're just feeding it. You can't eat. What can you do? It's a natural death. But if you give it to the vet to put it to sleep, nah, that is karma. I think you also mentioned something about the bad karma of not doing what you can do. Right? But it is doing that is the karma. Not doing is not the karma. Doing is a karma, but as I said, it could be dark and bright karma together. Uh, so you have to be aware of the consequences of such an action. Okay. Deworming tablets? I don't know about that. <laughs> we monks don't take deworming tablets. We go for Ayurveda stuff. <laughs> Ayurveda says you take neem leaf, crush it, and mix it with honey, make it with little pills, and you take, and then you will deworm. You don't kill the worms. Now, talking about neem, in India, they have cultivated a lot of neem trees, and then they extract neem from the fruits into concentrate, and then they make it into pills, or they make it into lotions. Pills for men, lotions for pets, application. Why? Because when you apply on pets who have a lot of ticks, mites or insects on their body, the neem lotion will not kill them. What it does is, it sterilizes them so that they won't reproduce. <laughs> so it's given to men for birth control. <laughs> Can I ask a provocating question that Sri Sasana Rakha have termites infestation or Okay, okay, good. That's a good question. In Sasana Raka, we took preventive measures. If you go to Sasana Raka, you will see that most of our buildings, I think 90% of them, are built on stilts. And then we have a termite cap. A termite cap is an inverted plate. Termites are not able to turn around that way. Ants can, but termites cannot. We got this idea from our architect because she has worked before on, on such projects. So termites can come up here, but they cannot turn a corner like that. So they don't infest our buildings. Now, in buildings which do not have stilts, what we do is, before we start the building, they will ask you whether you want to spray the thing to make sure that next time the termites won't come, but they'll last only for a few years. So we made some research, and we found out that there's one organic way of doing it, <laughs> which is, after you lay the foundations, before you cast the floor slab, you put a layer of fine sand, four inches fine sand above. Because termites cannot move on sand, the bodies will get scratched. Yeah, it's fine sand. So we, I never asked for termite exterminators to come and spray the place. I said, you just do this, and the termites won't come. Okay, 
But we also had a problem in our Sima Hall. That was the problem with borers. Wood borers, not termites. You see, our Sima Hall is made out of billion shingle roofing. And below that, we had many layers of waterproofing. And one of the layers specified by the architect is called marine ply. Now, our local contractors haven't heard of marine ply before. So what they got is this so-called waterproofing plywood with the black tar at the back. And then they put it up there, thinking that there's marine ply, telling us that that's all they know. So we also don't know what marine ply is. So we just allow them to put it up there. But that is the lowest quality of plywood because it's used for form work that is done in the open air. So when it gets wet, it can sustain some time, but it's very low quality. So a lot of borrows inside there. Then we saw powder dust dropping on the floor. So we were looking for a solution, what to do? Tried neem. <laughs> Spray neem. Also cannot, cannot work. Then, of course, the question of uh, calling exterminators to come was completely out as we never entertained that option. So finally, somebody suggested that we make another ceiling below that plywood ceiling, put an aluminum frame around, and then make a plaster ceiling. We need a plaster ceiling. So they are still up there. They are having a feast up there, but we are not kidding them. So that's how we did it. But the best thing is prevention. Before we start the building, we already prevented, make sure the termites don't come. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> now, for people who have got problems with termites in their roofing, what to do nowadays, very easy. Ma. Remove all the wood and put the GI frames, as some people are doing nowadays. But it will cost money. Na. But money only for this life, you know. <laughs> I think that's enough for tonight. Uh,